Our club takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm David Simmons. I'm president-elect of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Happy Pride. This month, communities around the world set aside time to remember, to celebrate, and to empower queer people, to honor the contributions that we make to the communities around us, to the flourishing sense of humanity, to individual freedoms and human rights, and our ability to exercise agency in society. Despite limitations of social distancing, the 2S LGBTQ population across Canada and our allies are gathering and proclaiming that we're not ashamed of our queerness, and that we will not be silent until we achieve full freedom and equality in our society, in Canada, and in the communities around the world. Today marks the Canadian Club's sixth official Pride event. Canada's oldest, most respected podium of record is holding its sixth Pride event. I have the immense privilege of serving as the club's third openly LGBT president. Institutions matter, institutions have power, and it's in moments like these ones that we diffuse that power to communities that matter. As we reflect on the triumphs and victories of pride as a movement, it's important for us to bring focus and pull into acuity the stubbornly persistent challenges that face our community. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the US Center of Disease Control's report of the first official HIV AIDS case, the beginning of what's known as the AIDS pandemic. Over the past year, the world has saw the devastating impact of a new pandemic an unknown disease to communities of people and businesses around the world that brought us to a pause. Both of these pandemics disproportionately impacted queer communities and both pandemics demand a comprehensive response for our community. Today, our panelists will engage in a conversation around how pandemics pierce through politics, business, media, and public health to force inward reflection on who we wanna be as a community and how our leaders and citizens can build more compassionate responses and spaces. Before we hear from our speakers, I'll give you the technical overview of how to participate. Uh, you'll click here, stream button. If you find your internet slow, the video quality may decrease, but your auto quality will remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions into the window and they'll be sent to our moderator. You can click the request help button located at the, the bottom right corner of the page for technical support. I'd also like to thank the, our, our sponsor for today's event for their generous support. Gilead Sciences is ensuring that today's conversation is free of charge to uh, the audience around uh, the country and increasingly around the world. We have information that says we have people zooming in from, from all over, which is awesome. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people together for 124 years. It's because of our sponsors that we continue to do that. Let me introduce our panelists. Nadine Sukarami is the executive director of Fife House. Melissa Kumi is the Vice President and General Manager of Gilead Sciences Canada. Joanne Simons is the CEO of Casey House. And Jamie Watt is the Executive Chairman of Navigator, founder of the Canadian Center for the Purpose of the Corporation and a past president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Today's conversation is moderated by Tim Collades, reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail. One of our traditions at the club that hasn't changed in the virtual world is that we toast to our country. 
If you have a drink nearby, I'd ask you to join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. Tim, I'll turn the Canadian club podium over to you. Hey there, everybody. Uh, so as David mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Tim Collads. A little bit of background about me. Uh, I cover Bay Street and finance for the globe, uh, but relevant to this conversation today, I've also written some personal features actually uh, about being gay on Bay Street. Uh, before joining the Globe, I used to work uh, on the street myself. Uh, and I've also uh, written about, uh, you know, the surrogacy process and, and, and having children through surrogacy. My husband and I now have, have, have two young kids uh, that take up all of our energy. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wanted to kind of lay a bit of a framework of what we're going to do today. Uh, and, and mostly let you know that the, the scope of the, of the conversation and, and the panel is, is intentionally broad. Uh, because we're both looking back uh, at um, kind of how we got here. As David mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a major anniversary, uh, but we're also trying to understand and apply some of those lessons um, to, to what we're going through now and, and where, where we're going, because it's becoming more and more clear that, uh, you know, COVID-19 isn't just going to end this summer, particularly in Canada. You know, we're all very hopeful about the second doses, but more and more people are saying this is a, an endemic virus uh, and it's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, in the same way that HIV AIDS has been. Uh, so while there's a lot of hope, um, you know, there's still a lot to, to learn and, and, and to change. Uh, I thought that I would kind of start out by giving everybody the opportunity to, one, give a little bit of intro about yourself, but two, maybe give a little bit of a framework for how you approach this or kind of where you come from. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that is because uh, I myself, I'm 35, uh, but uh, I don't remember much about uh, you know what we went through um, as a community and as as a you know global you know citizenry or community um, with HIV AIDS uh, and I'll give you one anecdote that kind of uh, I, I often tell that um, illustrates you know just how much we we forget or may not know. So my husband and I got married in 2014 and at our wedding, effectively one of my mother's cousins uh, was weeping uh, quite uncontrollably. And we didn't know why. And uh, afterwards, I kind of went to my mom at the side and I said, you know, what's up with her? Is she OK? And she said that her uh, my mom told me that her brother had died of, of AIDS uh, in the early 90s. And I had never heard about it my entire life. Um, you know, that gets into all the issues of stigma and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was just a very personal uh, understanding or, or lesson of just how much we still don't appreciate or acknowledge kind of what, what we've been through as, as a community. Uh, so maybe to kick things off, uh, try to keep it to one to two minutes each, but maybe Jamie, if you can go first, because um, you, you've written about this yourself in the past. Yeah, we'll know the pandemic is over when we figure out how to unmute ourselves. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm not 35 and, um, and I do remember um, I um, understand well why that woman was uh, was crying. I uh, I know before I was thirty, I'd been to fifty uh, funerals of friends who had died of HIV and AIDS, and uh, that's when I stopped counting. I couldn't count any. Um, I couldn't count anymore. Um, it was. Uh, it, 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 the time about of AIDS that we that, that we didn't really know too much about it, just like like when we were dealing with uh, with COVID, was my entire sexual coming of age as a gay man, and the fact that I cheated the disease, you know, I've often uh, thought about, and um, it, it it's not lost on me as I watch the uh, the Im impact of COVID on different communities that you know, how um, economic status and uh, privilege and social, determin social determinants of health are, 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 are so much a part of all of this. And we see once again in this pandemic that we're experiencing now, how precarity in uh, housing, how precarity in income, how precarity in access in other countries to healthcare you know, is uh, really affecting the difference. So we're really basically seeing um, the same thing, the same patterns uh, repeat themselves. 
Uh, maybe Nadine, you can uh, go next. And, and if you can as well, maybe just explain a little bit of kind of what your organizations do, just for those in the audience who, who may not be aware. Absolutely. Thanks, Kim. Or, sorry, Tim. I just called you Kim. My, my apologies. Okay. Uh, Jamie, um, you, I'm, I did not live through the, the, the other pandemic, but coming to the helm of Fife House, so for those who aren't familiar with our work, uh, we provide supportive housing to people living with HIV. We're the largest supportive housing provider in the country to who specifically all of our clients are people who live with HIV. And I think when I come into this work, I come to this work uh, coming out of community health. Um, I've worked across the nonprofit sector now for a few decades. Um, but the reason, and, and you know, my organization is going through a strategic plan right now and housing and homelessness is at the kind of forefront of people's minds as you drive through the city of Toronto and you see encampments and you see people really struggling. Um, and my board was looking at, well, HIV, what, what is the prevalence? What is the kind of, what is the, the, the pulse right now? And I would say the reason I'm here is, to, is much like what Jamie shared, it is still relevant and it is still here. It is a pandemic that is happening alongside the current COVID-19 pandemic. And what we're seeing is for people living with HIV, the disproportionate impact of positive talk, of isolation, of distancing, the stigma that goes along with being positive, whatever that looks like, and being tested, right? So, um, you know, I think the relevance for me and the reason I'm at Fife and the reason I'm in this work is because I see, again, not only the HIV positive component of it, but also, you know, the issues that affects all of the communities that come together. So though it may have been uh, a white cis gay men's disease, it is no longer that. We're now seeing uh, uh, the prevalence spread across newcomer, racialized, black, indigenous populations. And so that's also why I'm here because I bring a lens of equity and inclusion to kind of everything I do. And uh, I hope to bring that to the conversation today. Perfect. Uh, Melissa, maybe next. Sure, thanks. Thanks, David and Tim. Um, I wanted to just begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, I'm general manager of Gilead Sciences in Canada, um, but I'm also a proud LGBT ally, mom of a queer kid, um, and someone who does remember um, the early days of the pandemic, um, of, the, of, the, of the other pandemic, you know, if we think about HIV AIDS, as well as COVID-19. Um, at Gilead, uh, our mission is what we call creating possible. And every day, more than 10,000 employees around the world come to work to push the boundaries and work to make the impossible possible. Um, you know, more than 30 years ago when our company was started, um, it wasn't seen possible that we could control HIV um, with a single pill once a day. Um, we'd all love a vaccine and our, we have a team working hard to make that a reality, but we do now have treatments that can not only um, treat HIV, but also prevent HIV. And we as a community have the important new knowledge that uh, undetectable equals untransmittable. And in a status neutral way, we can approach HIV uh, and ending this pandemic together. Um, our company not only has worked in HIV, a cure for hepatitis C, but also um, brought the first therapeutic for COVID-19 to Canada. Um, and these breakthroughs were only achieved with strong partnership with the community, governments, academia, um, both here in Canada and around the world. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has a lot, frankly, in common um, with the HIV pandemic, particularly as we talk about the impact on vulnerable popul populations and communities of color. Um, and I think it's, this is a really timely uh, opportunity for us to um, reflect and, and talk about what's required for us to continuously evolve and continually to react to new challenges for, for COVID-19 and beyond. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Sure, and Joanne, I'm gonna wrap it up. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'm at Casey House. Uh, many of you may have known of it uh, back, you know, 33 years ago when we opened the doors as, as the first HIV AIDS uh, hospice and have transformed into now a specialty hospital uh, serving people with uh, advanced HIV. And, you know, a personal story, I too was just a kid during uh, the AIDS pandemic, but I remember even just as recent as 
as 12 years ago when a friend called and said, I've been diagnosed and I was at work uh, in a public space. And he said, you can't react to what I'm about to tell you. And he, the, the, the real fear and shame in his voice was palpable. And it wasn't about the disease itself. It was about him being able to acknowledge um, who he was as a gay man, uh, to inform his family and his friends that he was HIV positive, and the anticipation of the stigma that would result um, uh, from that uh, disclosure. And so, you know, Casey House has been a very uh, strong organization in my life and in my family's life uh, throughout uh, the past 20 years. And, you know, thrilled to be here when I joined five years ago uh, to help lead the transformation from hospice uh, to hospital, really in recognition of the evolution of HIV, given, as Melissa spoke to, uh, the tremendous advances uh, in treatment and allowing people to live with HIV. Um, you know, as an organization, we certainly have continually evolved uh, to remain relevant to our community and their needs, uh, clearly illustrated by uh, this beautiful building uh, I am sitting in now in the Heritage House, uh, the redevelopment project, uh, which had Jamie uh, at the leadership position at its home, ensuring uh, that we remained uh, consistently relevant to, to our community. Um, and I think that that has been certainly true through the pandemic as well. Our response to the pandemic, uh, as uh, I have to say, an exceptional uh, team of, of clinicians and support uh, around this organization, we have been able to be very swift uh, and continue to deliver exceptional care, both to people living with HIV, but to populations that uh, are at risk uh, for HIV as well. I think this conversation is really critical um, to ensure that we don't return to the before times to take what we have witnessed and experienced both during the AIDS pandemic and the current and think differently about equity, equality, you know, systems of oppression and really step into the light where all Canadians, all Canadians can be proud of how we drive future change. All right. That actually kind of leads naturally into where I was going next, uh, just, just, just by luck. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's, um, I haven't been able to forget about um, during the course of the pandemic is effectively public health 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 response and uh, you know what we have or haven't learned from the prior pandemic uh, essentially and uh, there was a piece very early uh, in the pandemic I think would have been around May or June of 2020 um, and there is I believe she's a Harvard prof and she wrote in the Atlantic her name is Julia Marcus and she was writing about you know I, I think the, the headline was quarantine quarantine fatigue is real. And that was during like the height of kind of the first lockdown. And one of the main thrusts of the piece was, you know, even during the HIV AIDS pandemic, you know, young men still had sex, you know, and there was this view that, you know, it wouldn't get me and, you know, it kind of walked through all the reasons. Uh, and it really kind of got to the heart of, you know, the idea of risk reduction versus being able to kind of lock everybody away, uh, so to speak. And uh, it, that stayed with me because you know now that so much time has passed, we realize a lot of a lot of the early ideas, uh, a lot of them that were technology based, didn't really pan out. So you know if you think about the covert alert app, um, we don't hear much about that anymore, right? And uh, one of the things that's really stayed with me is I think one of the, one of the epidemiologists somewhere uh, said that you know early on probably one of the best methods for, for controlling a lot of this would be medieval methods, um, and they didn't mean that in a negative way. They meant it in you know the the hard work of contact tracing, uh, um, you know, having a risk-based uh, uh, approach and things of that sort. And I feel as though, you know, the, whatever term you want to use, the HIV AIDS community, um, you know, the you know, communities that have endured this, um, allies as well, could have, you know, given a lot of this feedback upfront effectively, or could have helped guide, um, the way we've approached this. And I, things have gotten a lot better, of course. Uh, you know, we see case counts falling a lot. And some of that is because of vaccines. But uh, I guess, you know, Joanne, I'll come back to you. And I, I would say, you know, early on, was there much approach or was there much feedback taken from um, an organization like yours to address something like this? Um, and, and has that changed over time now that we know that things like the equity barriers and such have become such a, an important role in really getting to kind of, you know, that 75 to 80%, you know, vaccine uptake and things of that sort. 
So I think, you know, there were, there were obviously some significant learnings that were able to um, be utilized in this pandemic. You know, privacy legislation, right, is really important about people's health status um, and certainly was made much stronger because of HIV uh, to protect people, you know, from intrusive and invasive policies, uh, from being traced, you know, on our cell phones. And how does that then relate to uh, people who are now diagnosed with, with COVID? And what is the, you know, now the kind of common language is, well, have you had your vaccine? It's still actually personal health information, right? And so how do we make sure that we are balancing uh, the need to uh, protect, but also this need to obviously create, create a, a herd immunity? I would say the other kind of learning from the AIDS pandemic is, you know, there was a huge amount of conversation around PPE, right? You could not turn on a news channel in those first few months without talking about uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and certainly the global adoption uh, of universal precautions for, for blood and blood products uh, that really occurred in the wake of the HIV and AIDS uh, pandemic, I think has really uh, put, us in, put us in very good stead in terms of protecting our uh, frontline healthcare workers. Um, I think the, for, for certainly for Casey House and for our clients, I think the biggest uh, challenge with some of the uh, messaging um, was, was around, do not leave your house. Um, there is significant social isolation um, in our communities for people living with HIV uh, compounded uh, by stigma. And um, we have had a significant amount of death uh, both because people have not um, attended health appointments, gone to the hospital because the real fear uh, of contracting um, COVID and also the social isolation has dramatically increased people's substance use um, and challenges with mental health. And I, I don't think that that was recognized fully um, when we think about what quarantine impacts have. Um, as uh, somebody that I work with, um, who is HIV positive, she leads an organization, and she said the trauma of being quarantined today uh, was a real reflection on how she had to isolate herself when she was diagnosed with HIV initially. So I think we're, we're, uh, we have learned some things, but we've still got a, a long way to go. Uh, and Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you spent some time in San Francisco. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and so the reason why I bring that up is because, uh, you know, in Canada, we love to kind of compare ourselves um, for various reasons to the US. And on a lot of metrics, Canada did uh, very, very well relative to the US. Uh, but one of the areas that I've actually been astonished about um, uh, that doesn't really get much coverage here is San Francisco's uh, approach, um, or how San Francisco um, dealt with it all. Um, uh, do you think that that is partly a reflection of having gone through, um, and, and you know that that city was you know was kind of at the forefront of, of HIV AIDS, um, and uh, was also just interested in too in your reflections um, of kind of how this has been handled in Canada. I know this is a very broad question, but relative to kind of your own you know home country, um, uh, and and you know whether you think that um, as, as much as you know. This is a bit of a loaded question, so I'll, I'll state it more as a personal statement. But I would say that you know Canadians um, love to kind of beat ourselves up because we always know that we can do better. Um, but uh, wondering, you know, just what your lens has been on this and how you view um, our response on, on some on some level. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a multi part question, right? <laughs> Let's, let's go back to um, HIV and San Francisco. Um, and, and yes, I think that starting with the HIV um, and AIDS crisis in San Francisco, you had very, very strong active community outreach that translated, it's, it's now really deeply ingrained in the public health sector in San Francisco. You know, San Francisco as a city has been really one of the first to get to zero, um, zero new HIV infections. Now we can have a long conversation about privilege and how that sort of interrelates with the getting to zero story, but there is a, a group of people who have been good at coming together, taking action and taking action for the common good. You know, if we think about wearing a mask and you compare that to convincing the gay community to wear condoms, um, a mask I think is, is much less um, challenging for your, for your life and your, and your experiencing of your life as, than is a condom, right? But 
we were able to see the, the community come together and really align and, and until there was adequate treatment and other ways of approaching transmission, you know, you saw the community come together to address that. Um, as relates to COVID, um, you know, COVID's a really interesting thing to watch as an American, and I'm, I'm an American. You, know, you generally would have seen the U.S. government sort of central on the, on the, on the world stage. Um, and we took a different seat um, for a variety of reasons where we weren't actually driving, you know, the overall leadership that we might have expected. And there was allowed to be a difference of opinion um, of how should you approach this? What therapeutics made sense? Um, you know, what, what are the appropriate ways to do this? Should you wear a mask or not? Which is still a politicized debate, right? A public health issue has become completely politicized. So in Canada, I think where, how I would contrast it, up front, Canada did very, very well um, managing COVID-19. You did not see a lot of transmission. Um, you know, the early wave here was actually not anywhere near the level that we saw in other countries across Europe and the US. But then I think what you saw was Canada being taken by surprise a little bit, um, you know, after the December holidays where you, start to see, you started to see a significant increase. And at the same time, you hadn't seen the same rollout of therapeutics, the same rollout of vaccines. Um, and so I think what we saw was a wave that, um, that was generated for, for a variety of reasons that we're now just now um, kind of getting ourselves out of. So um, I think it's, it's really multi multifactorial. Um, the reason why we see Canada's response where it is um, in, in contrast to the United States. Uh, and, and where I want to go with this now is this idea of, you know, how do we get to um, the remaining, let's say, 20 to 30 percent um, who still don't have a vaccine, uh, you know, who um, maybe are skeptical but, but open to the idea. And I think I saw the latest polling. I think there's only like 6 percent said that they would not take a vaccine um, by, by any means. Um, we're seeing it more and more in Ontario now. I mean, that's that's the lens that I have, and a lot of us have because you know we're based in Toronto. Uh, but you're seeing you know hotspots targeted um, with vaccines and things of that sort. Um, using what we've learned from HIV/AIDS and and outreach and things of that sort, um, what are the best methods? I know that probably sounds like a bit of a corny question, but I think that it's it's really easy to kind of um, especially from a, from a political lens or a very broad macro lens to kind of come up with, with, with programs and schemes and things of that sort. But at the end of the day, sometimes people just need to be listened to and have their, you know, their, their frustrations or worries kind of heard. So uh, maybe Nadine, uh, I know you're kind of on the ground dealing with people, you know, uh, regularly um, in, in the HIV AIDS community. What, what, what advice would you give to kind of get to that um, yeah, I think what we're seeing that works, Tim, it, you know, first of all, is access. So the way initially things were rolled out was technology. You needed access to technology to book a vaccine appointment. Let's just go right there. Well, that left out homeless folks, older folks, people who didn't have access to that technology, the ability to navigate a really complicated system. So what ended up happening is actually at the Ontario Health Team level, and, and, and Joanne and I are both connected to the downtown East Toronto Ontario Health Team, what we did there and, and, you know, small groups of folks came out and talked about multiple ways in, right? So creating multiple points of access. And so for uh, people living in encampments, probably not a laptop computer or iPad because you have no Wi-Fi, you have no ability to connect. So there were mobile clinics, people popping in. And this was testing, vaccination, kind of all the way around. But also multi-pronged with that would be other pieces. So food, you know, connections to housing, connections to, you know, anything that might escalate or, or elevate them out of that moment that they're in. Um, you know, the kind of common thread we kept hearing was we're all in this together. Well, that isn't true. Some of us are on yachts. Some of us are, you know, kind of in a boat. Others are not even in, you know, are floundering in the water or, no, you know, not even able to swim. And so just looking at the multiple ways that, that people uh, needed that access. And then you talked about hotspots, Tim. Um, yes, geographically, we can identify hotspots, but there are also hotspots within. And that's where the intersectionality and the diversity of those communities come in. So if you think of the downtown East, you can have you know, multi-million dollar condos and houses on a street just adjacent to uh, some of the poorest neighborhoods and, and people living in you know, multiple families living in units. So, 
what we, um, I think really the long and short of it is multiple ways in, giving people multiple, all, all the options that they have, giving good information, lots of, you know, in all of the different languages that, that people need to access. And, and our staff actually were on the ground. When people, I was actually in a conversation yesterday talking about technology and access around housing intake. And I was mentioning to the people who are creating this technological piece, they said, well, the user is often the housing worker or the healthcare worker or the supportive worker, you know, the support worker. So yes, you do want to develop the technology for the front user as the client, but also know that there often is that support that's that's required in order for people to get access. And this is again, testing vaccines and the, and the whole lot. Kim, can I just uh, build on what Dean had to, uh, to say? Um, and first, I, I really need to start by uh, acknowledging the work that uh, that Nadine and Joanne are doing every day at the front lines of this, um, because uh, even in preventing uh, HIV and AIDS, and even if we can give people a pill to help uh, to to help manage. Uh, um, is that better? Yeah. Sorry, we have we have people who are living with HIV and AIDS every day, facing enormous challenges, and both uh, Five House and Casey House are really uh, uh, working awfully hard and um, doing that work still forty years later. And I think we have to we have to acknowledge that. Um, the thing that I think is really important, though is to remember why we have a community-based approach to HIV and AIDS. A and the reason we have a community-based approach is because nobody else would do it, right? The reason we have to provide, so we had to do this ourselves. Nobody would come to see us in the hospital. Nobody would bring our food tray in and feed us, right? We and nobody would would uh, ensure that our our uh, needs were put at the center of of of, of treatment decisions, right? And uh, the way drugs were brought to uh, to to trial and to market and so on. I mean, this all happened because a bunch of people got good and mad at the way that they were not being treated as much as the way as they were being treated. And as a result, they built a community response. And that is really what has endured after all of these years. And I think that is one of the lessons that we can learn in our long-term response to COVID-19 is it needs to be a community response. It's, it's not always a top-down, it can't be considered a top-down response, but it's a response from the bottom up, you know. People say that the government locked us down. The government didn't lock us down. We chose to stay home. We made a decision as a society to stay home. We're making a decision as a society to get vaccinated now. The government's not vaccinating all of us. The government's role, not ruling out anything. We're choosing these kinds of things. And those are the important, I think, enduring lessons of the HIV AIDS experience. You know, we learn to put the um, person living with HIV and AIDS at the center, the client, not the patient, at the center of our, of our response. And we used community to build that important response. Uh, Joanne, do you want to go ahead? So I think, I think that there's, there's some lessons, though, that we also don't want to carry forward. I think there has been um, some really challenging language that has occurred uh, during the stay-at-home orders uh, that are really pro problematic and, and mirror criminalization of HIV um, and the criminalization of simple uh, drug possession. And while not criminal, the current blood ban for gay men. So, you know, by making a virus, HIV or a substance use disorder criminal, it continues to perpetuate the stigma 
um, that is most certainly um, severe and, and ever present. Um, and so, you know, we know that uh, if you uh, are living with HIV and uh, you are maintaining your drug regime, as Melissa said, your virus load is undetectable, therefore untransmittable. But if you don't disclose your HIV, you can be prosecuted for aggravated sexual assault, right? Prison time listed on the sex registry. Similarly, you know, like a number of our clients who are using drugs to manage trauma and pain, um, it certainly, um, if you are incarcerated, you know, continues the cycle of trauma. And I think that these practices certainly impact our racialized communities more predominantly. So when the, uh, what felt like uh, carding was announced uh, by the government and, uh, you know, inappropriate powers given to the police uh, to stop people at random during the stay at home order, the HIV, HIV community was very swift uh, in their response. So, you know, how do we ensure uh, that certainly a community approach, Jamie, I think that's bang on, but how do we also ensure that policies around things like vaccines and access to them uh, doesn't continue to oppress some of our most marginalized and racialized communities um, and really think carefully about the policies we're putting in place that have both, you know, direct and uh, intended and unintended consequence. Nadine, did you have something else as well? Yes, thank you. Joanne, thank you for that. The piece I wanted to just riff off of when Jamie was speaking is the piece around, yes, absolutely community-based response and learning from the HIV community, but understanding the, the very significant difference. COVID the COVID-19 pandemic you know, was affecting all and the HIV pandemic only affected a particular group of people. And what comes with that is judgment. Right and, and othering. And that's something that we have to be really careful of in the current pandemic, that we are not blaming certain communities for irresponsible behavior mm -hmm. or not quarantining right. or, right? And again, those similar types of judgments we've seen and we hear, and that leads to, and Joanne, thank you for mentioning, you know, carding and, and policies and rules and restrictions that disproportionately, the empty, the, the um, the way in which it is, it is uh, enforced disproportionately affects certain people. And when we talk about, in particular, substance use, um, you know, and, and how HIV and, and other bloodborne diseases come from that use, let's look at um, why. Why are folks using? We know the use of, 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 you know, when we think of harm reduction, for example, people use substances to reduce the overall harm they're experiencing in the world. And it's often rooted in, in um, history, in their, their family history, in trauma. And Melissa, thank you for acknowledging the land, but really let's acknowledge the legacy, the colonial legacy and the impact that this has had. We've recently learned of the many, many, many missing and murdered children across the country. This is now resonating in the average Canadian's life, but let's understand the impact of that legacy on the people, indigenous people, and the folks that we are currently working with today. So I really, again, I just think it's contextualizing and understanding that our judgment, our, our, what we see and how we feel about these things are rooted in our identity, but we need to really shift out of our privilege and our, our location to think about what is happening outside of our circles. Right. Okay, and um, just so everyone knows, uh, I've been getting questions from the audience that have been sent in and they're being forwarded to me. Uh, and one of the questions I, I got actually Kind of relates to this, so I'll ask it now. Um, there was a question around, um, you know, for the folks that might be stigmatized right now because they are remain unvaccinated and and have uh, are still kind of on the fence about whether they should get the vaccine or not. Uh, there was a question about, you know, lessons that some of you have learned um, in in effectively convincing them or or talking to them ab about it. Um, because I think a lot of people, you know, even in their own personal lives, like I've got family members who have not been vaccinated. And I think a lot of people struggle with, you know, how to actually even bring it up without being judgmental and things of that sort. So the question was just, you know, um, are there any strategies that any of you have um, discovered or, or learned of that are, that help to one, you know, broach the conversation, but to, um, you know, help lead somebody you know, down a, an educated path for the lack of a better, lack of a better way of saying it. Um, uh, maybe Nadine, I'll come back to you um, uh, just because you seem to be kind of, you know, in the community, so to speak. Yeah, 
I, th I think there's a fine line between, uh, you know, of course, self-disclosure around whether you're vaccinated or not and inquiring. And then when you don't get the response you expect, what is, what is next, right? So, you know, my, my kind of current practices, I'm not asking. Um, I actually know, you know, I believe it's a personal choice and I, I kind of let civil liberties guide me through that process because, and maybe that's my employer lens as well, because I, you know, there's a lot of talk of mand mandating vaccines in different sectors and in different workplaces. And a lot of complex conversations are happening both legally and from a privacy lens. But if we think again about, uh, and I'll just, I'll just share my partner. Um, she has a very uh, complex health um, condition and, and she's one of the few, I think, whose specialist has said, not yet. You know, uh, nine people have, with her disease has been vaccinated. And of those nine, a high percentage of them had a very uh, poor re you know, response. And so because of the nature of that, she's not vaccinated. Well, we as a family are dealing with, she can't travel, right? She can't, there's a number of things we know that she's not gonna be able to do. So I come from it through that lens. Um, um, so I do respect when people, you know, maybe don't disclose that they're vaccinated. I think we have to just be really mindful of people's personal reasons and don't assume that they're anti-vaccine because I think that's kind of where we are is assuming that 20% or more are against vaccines. I think maybe they are just waiting and seeing and, and I guess it's sitting with respect and, um, and not assuming. And if I can uh, jump in there, yeah, Tim, yeah. um, a couple of things things to add on uh, to, to Nadine's comments is I think that there has been some tremendous success where um, both physicians, nurses, allied health, uh, people of color are actually working with, with the community um, directly. And so, you know, this, this notion of vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy is an interesting word. I mean, the Black community has, um, you know, experienced uh, tremendous uh, harms with uh, with drugs being tested on them using um, you know people uh, for medical experiments. I mean there there are uh, there are a lot of stories, um, and that is a legacy for which uh, people may not be trusting of of the vaccine. And so having leaders uh, that um, represent them and they can see themselves in uh, talking about and educating. I think is where some of the success has been coming to play. One of the other interesting conversations that has been happening in our community um, is around incentives, um, which is a dynamic conversation. Uh, it was just, I think, on the news this morning as I was coming into the hospital um, around incentivizing. And for communities that Nadine and I work with, um, it is actually an ethical discussion uh, because uh, incenting vulnerable communities uh, giving them cash or cigarettes, uh, in some cases, beer in others, um, is, is a very fine line. Uh, if somebody is hesitant to receive a vaccine, that they receive an incentive, which then is that actually informed consent. Um, so I think making sure that we have people who actually are speaking um, directly to their community um, has to be one of the most effective ways of, of ensuring uptake. Uh, another question that's come in, um, it was also on, on my own list, is, um, you know, the broad topic of, of medicines or drug development, uh, uh, which I think is, you know, everybody has been thinking about, uh, and there's so many ways to come at it. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll say two things. One, um, I personally believe, you know, if science saved us, you know, as we've seen with the latest Delta variant, um, you know, this thing's going to keep mutating, uh, and uh, uh, vaccines have been a, a very important way of diminishing um, its effect. Um, but uh, this really wasn't an overnight miracle. I know. I know. We talk about the the short timelines. Um, we being, you know, the media and stuff talk about the short timelines, and it really is incredible how fast we got this out there in trials and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's also been, you know, stories about how you know coronavirus research had very little money thrown at it uh, for a number of, for a number of years. Uh, from, from what I've read um, and from what I understand, um, a lot of pandemic planning was actually around influenza uh, and uh, you know uh, 
I actually heard that apparently, I think even in Canada, a lot of our pandemic preparation was around the idea of uh, influenza um, and or flu. And, you know, the idea that, you know, if worst case scenario, we had to lock down, um, we could do it for six months because that's the time in which it would, we would need to turn around a, a flu vaccine effectively because flu vaccines are quite common. Um, uh, so, you know, Melissa, you can tell me if, if I'm wrong there because uh, I'm obviously going to come to you. Um, but I guess the best broad way to come at this would be, you know, why is it so hard to do experimental um, vaccines um, and and test um, and trial them? Um, uh, because, you know, this obviously relates to HIV AIDS um, and the multi-decade fight and battle to to get something there on the medicines front. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that broad question uh, with you because I'm sure you're, you're asked about it a lot and your company deals with it quite a bit. Sure, thanks Tim. Um, I guess a couple things. I think one thing is to understand that all, all viruses are different, right? Um, HIV is a different kind of a virus than say a coronavirus um, such as COVID-19. And the, the challenge with an HIV vaccine is that the, the virus, the, the HIV virus is, it mutates quickly um, it actually infects T cells, which are the cells that are key to actually fighting infection. Um, and it has been very, very challenging. Our company, for example, developed a cure for hepatitis C that can now clear hepatitis C in, in 12 weeks. Um, we haven't been able to do that in HIV really because of the complexity there. And you've got a number of both companies, folks in academia, et cetera, who are working hard on a vaccine. It just hasn't, it's not for one of trying. Um, it's just been a very, very hard nut to crack. Um, on the case of coronaviruses, and, and could we have been better prepared? Um, you know, we had been working in, an, we have an emerging viruses group um, that has been looking at viruses such as Ebola. So um, the drug that we introduced to, um, to address COVID, it was actually first tried in Ebola. Um, and, you know, as you know, Ebola was um, a devastating, it still exists, but it was when, at its height was really a devastating pandemic. And we had a drug, we had it ready, we brought it in um, to start testing it in Africa and actually the pandemic subsided, thank God. Um, but it meant that we couldn't do clinical trials um, because we didn't have people who we could enroll in the trials. And so the challenge with drug development, I think what, what we saw here with vaccines, we saw use of this new MNR, mRNA technology, which really hadn't been used before. Um, and we saw multiple companies going all in. Um, and you just saw Novavax you know, get approved the other day. So multiple companies all in doing everything they can. And some companies, these, these products all have different um, efficacy, slightly different efficacy. They've got different adverse event profiles. Some have had challenges with manufacturing, um, but this has been done in the trial to, to bring the, you know, one of the vaccines to market enrolled 20,000 people. <laughs> you know, we're talking about scale um, that we've really not seen before in, in the speed that we had. So I don't know that anyone was waiting on the sidelines. You know, your, your point about flu. Yes, there is a, an influenza response document that has dictated Canada's response. You know, in the early days, that was the, the, the pandemic response document that they had. But I think very quickly, you know, in the conversations we've had with the government and others, they, they moved and, and morphed very quickly to understand the specific um, issues around this specific virus. Um, but part of it is, you know, we can, we can look at areas, but you actually need, need the bug, if you will, um, to develop the actual drug and certainly do a clinical trial to see if it works because the drug could work, but, but potentially not have a safety profile that's acceptable, for example. Um, and so I, I really feel if you, if you look at the timeline, um, you know, from the first, um, the first cases being, being logged, you know, in January of last year to now significant percentage, I think two thirds of the Canadian population now at least has one shot um, in their arm. They're, we're, we're trying to get um, that, that higher, but it's, it's pretty amazing, right? 18 months um, from the first cases to two thirds of adults being vaccinated. So I know we're all, um, we're all impatient. I just got my second shot yesterday, and so my arm still hurts a little bit. Um, but, You're um, great. I'm, I'm getting mine tonight, and I actually delayed it because I was worried about after effects for this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I would say, I mean, I think we're all impatient, but I think we've also learned that 
you know, we've had great partnership from Health Canada and the Canadian government, for example, and in governments around the world. We've seen regulators working in partnership with companies, companies partnering with each other, everything down to having enough glass vials to put the vaccines in. Like if you think about the stress on global supply chains um, around every adult in the world needing this vaccine, um, sure, we'd all like to be further along, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And, and I think you know, what we've seen is, had not been seen before. And, and, and Jamie, a question for you um, based off this, um, because you dabble in a lot of political circles. Um, you know, that's kind of what navigators built around, um, despite, you know, or on top of your past, I should say. Um, and I personally believe that for, let's say 90% of problems, um, uh, or I should say, uh, when you have a problem, 90% of the time, the, the answer tends to be money. Um, and whether or not there has been funding um, and, and uh, you know, the right incentives thrown at it, um, both in terms of vaccine drug development in Canada, but also in terms of kind of where we go with policy um, from here on out and preparing for the next pandemic, because everybody keeps saying there's going to be another one. Um, and there actually have been others, you know, we, talk, we, we know about SARS, um, of course, here, but, um, you know, H1N1, we got kind of lucky that that uh, actually didn't uh, blow up into be a bigger thing than, than, it, than it actually was, um, at least in North America. Uh, so, you know, effectively what what advice do do you give because you know when you look at the money side of things you know operation warp speed despite its name um was actually very successful in the u.s um you know uh so what uh what advice do you give to, to canadian politicians and and people in policy you know whether that's right. civil servants and things of that sort well it, well it, it it is true money is often the answer and and so is speed right actually starting to take things seriously i mean who will ever forget the uh, uh, press conference in the Reagan era where when the spokesperson, Larry Speaks, the uh, uh, press secretary of the president of the United States was asked a question about AIDS and he started to laugh. And you know, not only did he laugh in giving his answer, but the most devastating part of that videotape, if you watch it, is you'll see that everybody else in the press room was laughing about it, right? Because people weren't taking it seriously. So money and, uh, and, and, and governments moving to take a future pandemic seriously more quickly, I think will be important. I think the other thing that's is important is to really perhaps finish this discussion where we started, which is with the idea that these pandemics do not hit and, and uh, don't uh, affect everybody equally. And I think from a public policy point of view, from a political point of view, that's something that governments have to really understand. It, it was easy to see that in HIV and AIDS at first because it, it, uh, it, it uh, affected, uh, as Nadine said, that other population. Um, COVID-19 is a bit different because it would have affected everybody and didn't hold that same, that, that same stigma to it. But definitely, 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 uh, yeah, the, um, the impact was felt differently by people. And I think in planning, that's something that governments have to take into consideration. Well, money, speed, and the fact that we're not all the same and not everybody is impacted equally. Okay. Uh, the last topic that, that I've got uh, before I'm getting to a few audience questions with the, uh, the time we've got left is um, this idea of what I call suffering quietly. Um, and maybe that's, the, that's not the best way to say it, but um, you know, I, I think that uh, what I feel more and more, and I feel this within myself to some, to some extent, is you know, we, we so desperately want to move past this, um, especially with the idea of second doses being you know, here now. Um, society wants to snap back on some level. Uh, but uh, I forget the exact number of death counts in Canada right now, but I believe it's over 20,000. And on top of that, we also have folks who, you know, are dealing with long COVID um, and, and things of that sort. Uh, I would also add that, uh, this is a personal remark here, but I, you know, I do think that uh, we really have thrown away this idea that we're all in this together because, you know, schools in Ontario um, have been closed for, you know, a great number of months this school year. And uh, I often feel horrible for my colleagues who have their kids at home because I think that that's kind of been forgotten and it sounds like a very small thing but the mental health problems coming out of that are very very real I've been very lucky my daycare stayed open um, but everyone else with school-age kids is not in the same boat um, and so uh, I think that we've somewhat reached a point where um, people are timid to 
acknowledge their suffering or they feel that it's not, I don't say valid, but you know, the world doesn't care because the world wants to move on at large, so to speak. Um, some of you had mentioned things like isolation and how that is still ongoing in, in some communities. Um, wondering, you know, what you think we need to do both as a community, but also just as, as Canadians, as, as citizens, as friends, and, and crucially as employers too, um, because that's going to be another big thing that's coming up in the fall and, you know, the idea of return to work and, you know, uh, things of that sort. Uh, so maybe, um, Melissa, maybe you can start there. I don't know what angle you want to uh, uh, um, attack from that, um, but uh, wondering how, just, just how you personally think about it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. I, I think that um, particularly as a, as a woman, I'm, I'm very um, conscious of the fact that the she session um, caused by COVID-19, the departure of women in particular from the workforce um, has been uh, really significant. I was, I was on a panel in, in Mississauga um, recently, we were talking about just this issue because um, we, we do have a lot of issues, particularly with um, often women are disproportionately um, affected by issues around childcare. Um, there are also issues around, we think about um, inner partner violence and domestic violence, people who've been um, in there, they've been, they've been sheltering in place, um, often with the, with the person who is abusing them. Um, and so there are a number of issues that have been going on um, during this period of time. So, you know, as a, as a, a manager and as a, a leader of people, um, we're thinking a lot about how do we, how do we come back? Um, you know, a third of the people who are in our company now, who in our group in Canada, I've never met live. I've only seen them on Zoom. And so as we come back, and I think this is, again, another lesson from the LGBT, LGBTQ uh, community is we're going to need to really get to know each other and respect our diversity and learn about each other, um, almost with a new curiosity, because we're, we all have changed a lot, you know, in the, in the year plus that we have been locked down. A lot has happened, right? In, in a way, it's, it's like there's been this, um, this major disconnect. But at the other hand, we've all developed in certain ways. Kids have been out of school for a year um, you know, or more. And so um, I think we're just going to have to be very kind with each other and, and really seek to listen and seek to understand because it's going to be a different world um, than we left. It's, it, you know, it kind of, we sh almost shut off a light switch when we all um, pulled out um, of the world, but coming back in, um, it's going to be a very different place than it was where we left it. So we've just got to be really, I think, you know, really leaning in on the kindness that it's going to take to understand each other and listen to each other. And this uh, is a question from the audience because uh, time is uh, is running out, um, and it might be a nice way to end it. Um, so I'll, I'll direct it towards both um, uh, Nadine and Joanne, uh, and I'll just read it out. It says, can you share the most heartwarming way the LGBTQ plus community has supported each other during lockdown? So I, I don't know if there's a personal anecdote that comes to mind or something that you've, you've heard, um, but uh, yeah, just, just wondering if there's anything, if anything out there that um, actually shows some has shown or illustrates the resilience um, and the interconnectedness and, and community nature of it all. Well, I, in the in the queer community, we do have something we call chosen family, and so I think that community and and who we call family is not always biological, um, but we have we remain connected. So you know, um, I think in terms of the ways in which folks. And I don't think it was a choice to stay home for everyone, but you know, I think of some of my my queer friends and and, and again family, the people who co-parent my children, um, you know, and the people who are part of what I consider my family unit. Um, what I've seen in my personal life and what I've seen in most of the folks, the clients and residents in our in our organization is they they remain connected. So there were neighbors leaving, you know, uh, in, in some of many of our buildings in our congregate settings, you'd have neighbors leaving a note or a snack or something at their, you know, their neighbor's door, just to sort of say, I'm here if you need anything. But one thing I can say if people like numbers is that Fife House in the last year, at least in the first part of the, the 2020 part of, of COVID, uh, we delivered over 18,000 meals, hot meals to people living in our in our organization. So we're a housing organization. And that meant our food services team, which is a team of three people, imagine, 
uh, made warm meals and people who lived in three of our buildings received that warm meal at their door three times a week. And what they also got with that was what we call the wellness check. So they were able to say hi, distance, with PPE, how are you doing today? What's happening? And when I came on board here at Fife, I'll say that was a proud moment for me to be able to say our clients and residents had a warm person, an actual real person come to their door and check in to see how they're doing. So, you know, I think that chosen family all the way through to what community and family means for us. Every client and resident at, at Fife is a part of our family. All right. All right. I think my clock just hit one. So I believe it's time to wrap up, but I'll be honest, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to throw to or if somebody's going to jump in. I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim uh, and, and the panel, Melissa, Jamie, Nadine and Joanne. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation and the lessons that we can learn and hope to learn going forward. As our communities and businesses recover from the COVID pandemic, we hope they heed your sage advice and build more compassionate and inclusive spaces and build on the great work that you all are doing. Tim, thank you for your guidance of today's important conversation and your thoughtful insights. I hope you'll join us again. Um, guests, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, my name is Colleen Kennedy and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Club. So we have one more event left for the season on June 22nd, and we hope that you might join us for our final event. We'll be joined by the newly appointed president and CEO of CPP Investments, John Graham, in conversation with Amanda Lang to discuss how his unique experiences as a research scientist led him to take helm of Canada's largest pension fund investor. I wanna take the opportunity to thank Gilead Sciences for sponsoring today's event again. It would not be possible without your support and we so uh, appreciate um, your helping us serve our mission to engage Canadians in what matters most. And this conversation I believe really matters and I hope all Canadians take it to heart. Thank you to our AV supplier Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to join together today and guests, thank you for joining us again. Please stay healthy and safe.